Hello, I'm going to read to you chapter 14 from The Princess and the Goblin. It is called That Night Week. So, it's a pretty short chapter actually, but it's just one chapter today. Most days will hopefully be one chapter, so we'll see. During the whole of the week, Irene had been thinking every other moment of her promise to the old lady, although even now she could not feel quite sure that she had not been dreaming. Could it really be that an old lady lived up in the top of the house with pigeons and a spinning wheel and a lamp that never went out? She was, however, nonetheless determined on the coming Friday to ascend the three stairs, walk through the passages with the many doors, and try to find the tower in which she had either seen or dreamed of her grandmother. Her nurse could not help wondering what had come to the child. She would sit so thoughtfully silent and, even in the midst of a game with her, would so suddenly fall into a dreamy mood. But Irene took care to betray nothing. Whatever efforts Ludy might have or might make to get at her thoughts, and Ludy had to say to herself, what an odd child she is, and give it up. At length, the long-looked-for Friday arrived, and lest Ludy should be moved to watch her, Irene endeavored to keep herself as quiet as possible. In the afternoon, she asked for her doll's house and went on arranging and rearranging the various rooms and their inhabitants for a whole hour. Then she gave a sigh and threw herself back in her chair. One of the dolls would not sit, and another would not stand, and they were all very tiresome. Indeed, there was one that would not even lie down, which was too bad. But it was now getting dark, and the darker it got, the more excited Irene became, and the more she felt it necessary to be composed. I see you want your tea, princess, said the nurse. I will go and get it. The room feels close. Close. I will open the window a little. The evening is mild. It won't hurt you. There's no fear of that, Ludie, said Irene, wishing she had put off going for tea, for the tea till it was darker, when she might have made her attempt with every advantage. I fancy Ludie was longer in returning than she had intended, for when Irene, who had been lost in thought, looked up, she saw it was nearly dark, and at the same moment caught sight of a pair of eyes, bright with the green light, glow glowering at her through the open window. The next instant, something leaped into the room. It was like a cat with legs as long as a horse's. Irene said, but its body, Irene said, but its body no bigger and its legs no thicker than those of a cat. She was too frightened to cry out, but to, but not too frightened to jump from her chair and run from the room. It is plain enough to every one of my readers what she ought to have done, and indeed Irene thought of it herself. But when she came to the foot of the old stair, just outside the nursery door, she imagined the creature running up those long ascents after her and pursuing her through the dark passages, which, after all, might lead to no tower. That thought was too much. Her heart failed her, and turning from the stair, she rushed along to the hall, whence, finding the front door open, she darted into the court, pursued, at least she thought so, by the creature. So what should she have done? She should have used the stairs to go see her grandmother. No one happening to see her, on she ran. Unable to think for fear and ready to run anywhere to elude the awful creature with the stilt legs, not daring to look behind her, she rushed straight out of the gate and up the mountain. It was foolish indeed, thus to run farther and farther from all who could help her, as if she had been seeking a fit spot for the goblin creature to eat her in, his in at his leisure. But that is the way fear serves us. It always takes the side of the thing that we are afraid of. The princess was soon out of breath with running uphill, but she ran on, for she fancied the horrible creature just behind her, forgetting that, had it been after her, such legs as those must have overtaken her long ago. At last she could run no longer, and fell, unable even to scream by the roadside, where she lay for some time half dead with terror. But finding nothing lay hold of her, and her breath beginning to come back, she ventured at length to get half up, and peer anxiously about her. It was now so dark that she could see nothing. Not a single star was out. She could not even tell in what direction the house lay. And between her and home, she fancied the dreadful creature lying ready to pounce upon her. She saw now that she ought to have run up the stairs at once. It was well she did not scream, for although very few of the goblins had come out for weeks, a stray idler or two might have heard her. She sat down upon a stone, and nobody but one who had done something wrong could have been more miserable." She had quite forgotten her promise to visit her grandmother. A raindrop fell on her face. She looked up, and for a moment her terror was lost in astonishment. At first she thought the rising moon had left her place, and drawn nigh to see what could be the matter with the little girl sitting alone, without hat or cloak, on the dark bare mountain. 
but she soon saw she was mistaken, for there was no light on the ground at her feet, and no shadow anywhere. But a great silvery globe was hanging in the air, and as she gazed at the lovely thing, her courage revived. If she were but indoors again, she would fear nothing, not even the terrible creature with the long legs. But how was she to find her way back? What could that light be? Could it be? No, it couldn't. But what if it should be? Yes, it must be. Her great-great-grandmother's lamp, which guided her pigeons home through the darkest night. She jumped up. She had but to keep that light in view, and she must find the house. Her heart grew strong. Speedily, yet softly, she walked down the hill, hoping to pass the watching creature unseen. Dark as it was, there was little danger now of choosing the wrong road. And, which was most strange, the light that filled her eyes from the lamp, instead of blinding them for a moment to the object upon which they next fell, enabled her for an instant to see it, despite the darkness. By looking at the lamp and then dropping her eyes, she could see the road for a yard or two in front of her, and this saved her from several falls, for the road was very rough. So she's saying that, that normally if you have if you are looking at a bright light or a lantern, you look at it and then your eyes are kind of blinded by the light, right? So when you look at something, you have that glare or that, um, like it, it makes it so the light kind of ruins your ability to see for the next few seconds. But with this light, it kind of like magically gave her the ability to see a few yards in front of her in the darkness when that's not really how light works. So it's a magic light, which we already knew. But all at once, to her dismay, it vanished, and the terror of the beast, which had left her for the, left her the moment she began to return, again laid hold of her heart. The same instant, however, she caught the light of the windows and knew exactly where she was. It was too dark to run, but she made what haste she could and reached the gate in safety. She found the house door still open, ran through the hall, and without even looking into the nursery, bounded straight up the stair and the next and the next. Then turning to the right, ran through the long avenue of silent rooms and found her way at once to the door at the foot of the tower stair. When first the nurse missed her, fa her, she fancied she was playing her a trick and for some time took no trouble about her. But at last, getting frightened, she had begun to search. And when the princess entered, entered the whole household was hither and thither over the house hunting for her. A few seconds after she'd reached the stair of the tower, they had begun to search the neglected rooms, in which they would never have thought of looking had they not already searched every other place they could think of in vain. But by this time, she was knocking at the old lady's door. So the whole house is looking for her. They're all panicked because, again, she is like the little princess, the, the queen of the house, really. Like, she's super important. And they're, all their lives, all their jobs are about keeping her safe. Um, and making sure that she's loved and cared for. And then she goes missing, and all their jobs are on the line, right? They're all freaking out, and they like her. She's a sweet princess. Um, and so she's still missing for them, but she has made her way to her grandmother's door. She found it based on the being able to follow the lamp. So we'll see what happens next. <laughs>